Greetings wherever you are. Greetings um, on Dego Chiang. Uh, today I want to discuss about uh, understanding the book of Revelation. Understanding the book of Revelation. Why do we think, why do you think we should understand the book of Revelation? Uh, the book of Revelation as events that are listed, events that will happen during the last day. And now we are in the last days. And in fact, uh, Paul uh, warned us through the book of Timothy. As we read the book of Timothy, uh, in fact, uh, chapter, the book of Timothy, 2 Timothy, chapter 3. I would love to read the book of Timothy, chapter 3, verse 1. I will start it from verse 1. It says, But know this, that in the last days, perilous times will come. For men will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boasters, proud, blasphemous, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, unloving, unforgiving, slanderous, without self-control, brutal, despisers of good, traitors, headstrong, haughty, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, having a form of godliness but denying its power, and for such people turn away. So the reason why we should study, uh, we should understand the book of prophecy is that all those things that were written in here, there, are now being fulfilled in our very eyes. Some have been fulfilled. There are prophecies that have been fulfilled. Others are still yet to be fulfilled. So we should understand it. Revelation is uh, a book that was written by John. John was one of the disciples of Jesus Christ who died a natural death. John, uh, having been uh, in the island of Patmos, saw Jesus Christ, and Jesus Christ revealed to him what will happen in the latter days. He revealed to him what Daniel saw and other prophets. So, uh, here we are supposed to know and understand, because the book of Daniel, if we go to the book of Daniel, I want to read, Daniel wrote this book, and when he was given all the things that he wrote, he did not understand uh, the books that he wrote. The prophecies that Daniel wrote, he could not understand them well. But now we are told that me and you should be able to understand this book of Daniel. Now let's read the book of Daniel, and we are going to read from, um, I mean, chapter 12 of Daniel. And verses um, 8, it says, Although I had, I did not understand. Then I said, My Lord, what shall be the end of these things? So Daniel wrote all this. He penned down all this, but he did not understand. So he wanted to understand. Therefore, he asked his Lord. Um, and he said, uh, my Lord, what shall be the end of these things? And verse 9, look at what the Lord told him. And he, uh, and he said, Go your way, Daniel, for the words are closed up and sealed till the time of the end. So this thing was sealed. The prophecies that Daniel gave were sealed till the end. Many shall be purified, made white and refined, but the wicked shall... Uh, do wickedly, and none of the wicked shall understand, but the wise shall understand. So the wise shall understand. So who are the wise? Uh, are you one of the uh, uh, part of the wise? So so that you can understand. I hope this uh, someone will really help you as you continue to listen. Now Daniel, having wrote, he did not understand everything. Until in verse 13 of Daniel 12. But you go your way till the end. For you shall rest. And will arise to your inheritance at the end of the days. So the angel is telling Daniel to rest. To go his way and he will rest. Rest means he will die. Then he will arise to the inheritance at the end of the days. Which means he will uh, be resurrected at the end of the days. 
So all these things that Daniel wrote was revealed. And that's why the book of Revelation uh, is called Revelation. Because it simply means unveiling. Something that was, no, uh, was like a secret is now being made simple. Something that was a mystery is being demystified. Now we are seeing in the book of uh, Revelation chapter 1 and verse 3, now we are encouraged and we are promised uh, that when we read, we are blessed. Uh, the book is saying, Revelation 1 verse 3, it says, Blessed is he who reads and those who hear the words of this prophecy and keep those things which are written in it for the time is near. So, uh, you are blessed if you read, if you hear, and keep the things that are written here in. So, that is why we should read Revelation and the prophecy at large. So, again, why should we read? Why should we know this prophecy? Does it add any value? One day, as I was discussing with some Pentecostal pastors, about three of them, and I was asking them some questions, they tried to tell me, in fact, the questions were coming from the book of Revelation. They told me that uh, they are not interested to know the book of Revelation because it is not uh, pegged, it does not have any importance in the salvation. So they say those things are just, uh, they don't add value to their salvation. So that's why they don't want to burn their midnight oil studying the book of Revelation. But again, the Bible is telling us that uh, uh, you are blessed if you read, if you hear, and if you do the things that are written here in. The book of uh, Luke, if you go to the book of Luke, I think chapter 21, and we are going to read verse 36, so that we can see another importance of studying and maybe watching all these things that are happening. It says, uh, for uh, uh, 36 say, watch therefore and uh, pray always that you may be counted worthy to escape all these things that will come to pass and to stand before the Son of Man. So you should be watching the world events, how they are aligned to the prophecies that we are studying. Because uh, we should be knowing where are we in prophecy, where are we going, uh, what are the prophecies that have been fulfilled and which prophecies are yet to be fulfilled. So that's why we should be studying the prophecy anyway. So again, this book of uh, Revelation, you know very well, as we read it, it was given by God to Jesus Christ. And le let us read it from chapter 1, verse 1. The revelation of Jesus Christ. So this revelation is of Jesus Christ which God gave him to show his servants. So God gave the book of Revelation. He gave it to Jesus Christ to show his servants things which must shortly take place. So these things, we should know them because they are given to servants. Are you among the servants that want to know what God has in store before Jesus Christ comes? So it continues to say, And he sent and signified it by his angel to his servant John, who bore witness to the word of God and to the testimony of Jesus Christ to all things that he saw. Then it, is, it says, Blessed is he who reads and those who hear the words of this prophecy and keep those things which are written in it for the time is near. So here we find that we should be reading this book. Uh, because the time is near. And let me tell you, we should understand that this book has now been revealed. The book that was sealed by Daniel is now revealed. The book that was sealed during Daniel's time is now revealed. And now the book is, uh, the, the Bible is telling us in uh, Revelation chapter 5, uh, who removed the seal now, if we read the book of Daniel, chapter, I mean Revelation 5, and verses 1, And I saw, 
In the right hand of him who sat on the throne, a scroll written inside and on the back, sealed with the seven seals. So then, uh, I mean, John is seeing a book, uh, I mean, a scroll written inside and uh, and um, inside and on the back, and then sealed with seven seals. Imagine there was that is a book, and there were seven seals round this book. This book was written in front and at the back with seven seals. Let us see what's happening in verse 2. Then I saw a strong angel proclaiming with a loud voice, Who is worthy to open the scroll and to lose its seals? So the angel was asking a question there, a very vital one. Uh, who is worthy to open the scroll and to lose its seals? In verse 3, and no one in heaven or on earth or under the earth was able to open the scroll or to look at it. Imagine. So in heaven, on earth, under the everywhere, nobody could open the seals. The seven seals, nobody could do that. And in fact, uh, if we go to verses 4, So I wept much because no one was found worthy to open and read the scroll or to look at it. This is John. John wept. He was very bitter because no one was able to open the seals. Nobody was able to open the scroll. Uh, you see? Uh, nobody was able to open and read the scroll or look at it. Now verse 5. But one of the elders said to me, Do not weep. Behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has prevailed to open the scroll and to lose its seven seals. So, uh, here we find that there is now hope in verse 5. That one of the 24 elders, remember there are 24 elders in heaven. So one of them just told John, because John was weeping. Do not weep. Behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has prevailed to open the scroll and to lose its seven seals. So here we find that now in verse 6, and I looked and behold in the midst of the throne and of the four living creatures and in the midst of the elders stood a lamb as though it had been slain, having seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent out into all the earth. Did you know that there are seven spirits of God? So God has seven spirits. By the way, Bible uses numbers to signify something. Seven simply means completion or perfection. Seven spirits, seven powers of God. So here, uh, John is singing in the midst of the throne. I mean the throne of God. Uh, is seeing uh, in the midst of the elders, there was a lamb. And if you, know, if, if you look it, at it keenly, it is a lamb with capital L. A lamb, as though it had been slain. Uh -huh. Having seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God, sent out into the, all the earth. Now verse 7, Then he came and took the scroll out of the right hand of him who sat on the throne. So this is a lamb, but he came to the person who sits on the throne. Probably this is, just, this, is, this is God who sits on the throne. And he took this book, this scroll. Now in verse 8, Now when he had taken the scroll, the four living creatures and the 24 elders fell down before the Lamb. They all fell down before the Lamb with capital L. Each having a harp and the golden bowls, full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. Did you know that the prayers of the saints are like incense? They, 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 they are sweet. Now, in verse 9, And they sang a new song, saying, You are worthy to take the scroll. That is that lamb. They are singing the song now. They are happy now. Singing the song. And they are saying, that the song is saying, You are worthy to take the scroll and to open its seals. For you are slain, and have redeemed us to God by your blood out of every tribe and tongue and people and nation. Now here, 
we have to let the Bible interpret itself. For the Bible, if we look at the book of um, 1 Peter, chapter 1 and verse 18, says, knowing that, um, in fact, 2 Peter, uh, sorry, 2 Peter is saying something here that we must read before we know what is happening here. It says from verse 18 uh, of um, first Peter, and we heard this voice which came from heaven when we were with him on the holy mountain. And so we have the prophetic word confirmed, which you do well to heed as a light that shines in a dark place until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your hearts. Knowing this first, that no prophecy of scripture is of any private interpretation. So, private interpretation simply means that you cannot interpret the scripture the way you think. Or according to your knowledge that you obtained from theology or any other thing. But the Bible is saying this. Uh, For prophecy never came by the will of men. But holy men of God spoke as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. So the people who wrote this prophecy, the people who wrote the Bible, books of the Bible, they were inspired by the Holy Spirit to do it. They did not put their mind, their, their, their theology, their, all their, their, their thinking into the Bible. But they were led by God himself, that the Holy Spirit so here, we want to see there is a lamp, and a lamp with a capital L, allowing the Bible to interpret itself, because in Isaiah 28 verse 10, we are told that here a little, there a little. Yeah, here a little, there a little. Precept, precept upon precept, precept upon precept, line upon line, line upon line. So that is how we use it. That is what we do to interpret and to understand the prophecy of the Bible. So here, the lamb in John chapter 1. We are going to John chapter 1 and verses 29. Uh, it says, verse 29, The next day, John saw Jesus coming toward him and said, Behold, the lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world, so if we go there, we find that um, in Revelation uh, 5, verse 9, and they sang a new song saying, You are worthy to take the scroll and to open its seals. For you are slain, that is that lamb, for you were slain uh -huh, and have redeemed us to God by your blood out of every tribe and tongue and people and nation. So this is the lamb that was slain so that he can pay ransom for all of us. He paid a price to buy all of us back to God. So out of every tribe and tongue and every nation, this is Jesus Christ. He was the one who was worthy to open the scroll and I mean to, to read it and to remove the seals. So here we find that Jesus Christ is the one who removed the seal. And then we are told here, because we are uh, delving in uh, what we call understanding the book of uh, Revelation. Revelation now is a book that should be now easy to understand because it has been unveiled to all of us to understand it. It has now been made easy through the Holy Spirit through humility that God has given to his servants. So that is what we should know, that this book has been revealed to us. Now, here we go to the Revelation chapter 1, and we are going to verses um, uh, 5. We are going to verses, uh, let's go to, first of all to Revelation chapter 1, and we go to verses 4. John, the seven to the seven churches which are in Asia. So this book was written, first of all, it was written to the seven churches that were in Asia Minor. By that time, John was the bishop. Bishop simply means overseer. 
Overseer simply means a pastor overseeing more than one church. Anyway, that is what is there. John, to the seven churches which are in Asia, grace to you and peace from him who is and who was and who is to come. That is Jesus Christ. And from the seven spirits who are before his throne. So you, you see there are seven spirits. And from the seven spirits who are before his throne and from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn from the dead, and the ruler of the kings of the earth. So Jesus Christ, the one sitting on the throne is God himself. And Jesus Christ is also sitting on the throne on the right hand side of God. You should know that. And we are told, and from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn from the dead, and the ruler of the kings of the earth. Now, if the Bible says the firstborn from the, uh, from the dead, that one simply means he was the first of the first fruit. He is the first to be resurrected. You see? Um, to him who loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood and has made us kings and priests to him, to his God and Father, to him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. And now here in verse 7, Behold is coming with clouds and every eye will see him, even they who pierced him and all the tribes of the earth will mourn because of him, even so. Amen. So John is trying to write everything that the angel was telling him. Remember I said uh, earlier that John was in the uh, Isol of Patmo. Here is where he received this prophecy. Here is when, uh, where he received this revelation. John by then had to be a bishop. He was overseeing the churches in Asia Minor uh, that were along the Aegean Sea. The Aegean Sea. And in fact, the first one from next to the sea was called uh, uh, it was called Ephesus. Then the last one there to the last end was called Laodicean. So here we see I in verses 8 I am the Alpha and the Omega the beginning and the end. My friend, don't think that Jesus here had a beginning because Jesus is talking about the beginning. Beginning of God's plan. This beginning of God's plan and simply means the completion of God's plan. Yes, that is what the end means. Yeah. So, says the Lord, who is and who was and who is to come? The Almighty. So, uh, we are told in um, verses 9, I, John, both you, your brother and companion in the tribulation and kingdom and patience of Jesus Christ, was on the island that is called Patmos for the word of God and for the testimony of Jesus Christ. So, this, this is where he received the revelation. And he wrote the book of Revelation. In verse 10. I was in the spirit on the Lord's day. I was in the spirit on the Lord's day. And I heard behind me a loud voice as of a trumpet. Most people do uh, say that Lord's day means a day of worship or something. I mean, we should be very careful on how we interpret the Bible. Lord's day. Uh, if you read the book of Sephaniah, if you read the book of Sephaniah, one, I think it's one verse 15, and we're going to read here, the, the book of Sephaniah, we'll find what Lord's Day means. And, and even the, the, the book of um, Zechariah 14, Sephaniah, we're starting with Sephaniah 1, and um, verses 15, we will know, because we want to allow the Bible to interpret itself. We don't now here want to listen to any dogmatic teaching by anybody who began his association somewhere or a movement or a church. Here we want purely to allow the Bible to interpret itself. Most people have said the Lord's Day means a day of worship. Uh, some people say it is a Sunday or something. I don't know. But if you read Sephaniah 1, 15, it says, That day is a day of wrath, a day of trouble and distress. A day of devastation and desolation. A day of darkness and gloominess. A day of clouds and thick darkness. 
Uh, so if you go to verses um, 5, 16, a day of trumpet and alarm against the fortified cities and against the high towers. So that is what we call the Lord's Day. The Lord's Day is a day of gloominess. It's a day of devastation. It's a day of distress. It's a day of desolation. It's a day of darkness and alarm. And a day when the fortified cities are, are made low. Now, again, if you go to the book of Micah, I mean uh, the book of Malachi, I think it gives also a little bit of what the Lord's Day means so that we can explain because we want to understand the book of Revelation. Let's go to the book of Micah, I mean chapter 4 and verses um, verses 1. For behold, the day is coming, burning like an oven, and all the proud, yes, all who do wickedly will be stubble. And the day which is coming shall burn them up, says the Lord of hosts. Uh -huh. We're going to verses, um, uh, yeah, says the Lord of hosts, that will leave them neither root nor branch, in verse 2, but to you who fear my name, the son of righteousness shall arise with healing in his wings, and he shall go out and grow fat like stall-fed calves. So this is a day of wrath. A day when, a day of vengeance. Now here again we find that uh, in Zechariah. If you can read Zechariah, the book of Zechariah 14. is also giving us uh, what this means in um, uh, chapter 1 of Zechariah 14. Behold, the day of the Lord is coming. Behold, the day of the Lord is coming. And your spoil will be divided into your midst. For I will gather all the nations to battle against Jerusalem. The city shall be taken, the houses rifled, and the women ravished. Half of the city shall go into captivity, but the remnant of the people shall not be cut off from the city. So this is the day of the Lord. The day of the Lord here simply means a day when the vengeance is being paid to the uh, unrepentant people of this world. Vengeance. That is what the, the Bible is telling us. Uh, so, let's go back there to Revelation chapter 1. And verses, uh, because we are in verses 10. So, we have understood, I was in the spirit on the uh, Lord's day. And I had uh, behind me a loud voice as of a trumpet. Saying, that's verse 11. I am the Alpha and the Omega. The first and the last. And what you see, write in a book and send it to the seven churches which are in Asia, to Ephesus, to Smyrna, to Pagamos, to Theatra, to Sardis, to Philadelphia, and to Laodicea. So this is, uh, these are the things that were written for the churches. And let me tell you, these seven churches simply gives us a clear picture of the seven eras of the churches until Messiah comes. The seven eras of the churches until Messiah comes. So each and every church, at that moment, those churches were existing during uh, John's time. But again, the message that was given here symbolized that the churches will be in errors one after the other, one after the other, until the seventh church, which is Laodicea, the Lucum church. Uh -huh, we go there. Um, we find that the beginning of salvation of humankind is Jesus Christ. That's why it says is the Alpha. Alpha simply means the first. And is the Omega. Omega simply means the last. And here it gives us a, a clear picture that Jesus Christ, God began, uh, I mean, uh, the, the, the process of salvation. The master plan of salvation, he began by Jesus Christ. And he is going to make it perfect through Jesus Christ. And that's why if you read the book of First Timothy, I mean, no, not First Timothy, but First Corinthians, chapter 15. Chapter 15. And uh, let's see verses 20. It says, But now Christ is risen from the dead and has become the first fruit of those who have fallen asleep. For since by man came death, by man also came the resurrection of the dead. 
So for as in Adam all die, even so in Christ all shall be made alive. But each one in, in his own order. Christ the first fruit. Afterward, those who are Christ at his coming. So I'm reading verse 24 of uh, 1 Corinthians. It says, Then comes the end when he delivers the kingdom to God the Father, when he puts an end, end to all rule and all authority and power. So Jesus Christ began the process of salvation, the master plan of God, uh, of salvation, of saving humankind, began through Jesus Christ. And it will be perfected by Jesus Christ. So that's what we mean by saying Alpha and Omega. And here it says, For um, therefore, I'm reading verse 24 again. Then comes the end when he delivers the kingdom to God the Father. When he puts an end to all rule and all authority and power. In verse 25, For he must reign till he has put all enemies under his feet. Then the last enemy that will be destroyed is death. For he has put all things under his feet. So here, the last enemy to be destroyed is death. So Jesus is coming to put all things in order. Yeah. So that's why, in fact, even in uh, the book of Acts chapter number 3. I love that verse so much. Acts chapter number 3. And verse 21, I think, let's see it. Uh, Acts chapter 3 and verse 21 gives us also a picture of how Jesus Christ is the beginning of everything and the end of everything. It says in verse 21 that, who, um, let's see from verse 20, verse 20, and that he may send Jesus Christ who was preached to you before, whom heaven must receive until the times of restoration of all things which God has spoken by the mouth of all his holy prophets since the world began uh, so we see there now going back to the book of Revelation and we are going to chapter it's chapter 1 and we are going to verses 12 then I turned to see the voice that spoke with me and having turned I saw seven golden lampstands and in the midst of the seven lampstands one like the son of man clothed with a garment down to the feet and guarded about the chest with a golden band. So John saw a menorah, menorah, the seven golden lampstands. So 14, his head and hair were white like wool. So John is now seeing Jesus Christ in his splendor, Jesus Christ in his glory. He is now not looking at the slain lamp now. He is now the king full of glory like of his father. So here he said, his head and hair were white like wool, as white as snow, and his eye like a flame of fire. I hope you could not see that Jesus Christ. Uh, his feet were like the were like fine brass, and his uh, if refined in a furnace, and his voice has the sound of many waters. So this is how Jesus was looking at, uh, like when he was now in heaven, sitting at the right hand of God, having all the glory, having all the power. And verse 16, and you remember, he, he, he promised us. In fact, uh, Jesus Christ promised in uh, Matthew chapter number 28. Matthew chapter number 28. Uh, let's read it. Verses uh, 18. Uh, 28 verses 18 of Matthew. It says, and Jesus came and spoke to them, saying, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. All authority has been given to him in heaven and uh, on earth. So here uh, we are going. It says in verses um, 16, he, uh, he had in his right hand seven stars. Out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword. And his countenance was like the sun shining in its strength. So this uh, Jesus was uh, like uh, had a very magnificent splendor. I in verses um, seventeen, and when I saw him, I fell at his feet and dead uh, uh, as dead. 
But he laid his hand and on me, saying to me, Do not be afraid, I am the first and the last. I am he who lives and was dead, and behold, I am alive forevermore. So, amen. And I have the keys of Hades and of death. Write the things which you have seen, and the things which you are, and the things which will take place after this. So he was commanded, John was commanded to write the things which um, he has seen, the things which are going to be, is going to see, and, and maybe the things which will take place after that moment. <clears throat> so in verse 20, the mystery of the seven stars which you saw in my right hand now is revealing to us the mystery of the seven stars which John saw in his right hand. Uh, so he's saying, the mystery of the seven stars which you saw in my right hand and the seven golden lampstands, the seven stars are the angels. So the seven stars are the angels. So let not somebody come and tell you something about seven stars without mentioning that they are angels. So that is what the Bible is trying to, to tell us. And the seven golden lampstands, the seven stars are the angels of the star, seven star, uh, churches, and the seven lampstands which you saw are the seven churches. So here we are through with verse 1. So this is how the Bible, I mean the book of Revelation chapter 1 is, that this one was a revelation of God. I mean revelation of Jesus Christ. Given by God to show, to show his servants things that must shortly take place. So that is what is in there. Mm -hmm. So in the next um, part of this, in the next part of understanding the book of Revelation, uh, we find that when we want to understand this book of Revelation, we need not much theology to understand it. What do we need most? Number one, we need the Holy Spirit. Because the Holy Spirit will reveal to us what this book is all about. And by the way, if you read the book of John chapter 16, I would uh, like to read the book of John chapter 16 and verses 13. Uh, John 16 verse 13 says, uh, However, when he, the spirit of truth, has come, he will guide you into all truth, for he will not speak on his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak, and he will tell you things to come. So he will tell you things to come. So these are things to come. In Revelation, those are things to come, and some have taken place. Some events have taken place. Some prophecies have been fulfilled. So it, it's the Holy Spirit who will guide you to know, I mean, uh, all that should take place. And in fact, in verse uh, in John chapter 14, verses 26, he says, But the Helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all things that I said to you. So that is the work of the Holy Spirit. And again, how will you understand this? Uh, prophecy. There is also another key in uh, the book of Revelation chapter 111. The book of Revelation chapter 111 and verses um, verse 10. 111 verse 10 says, the fear, the, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. A good understanding have all those who do his commandments. His praise endures forever. So good understanding of this prophecy have those who do God's commandments. So that is why most people are fumbling with the, with the prophecy every now and then. They try to teach what their what they, what they church leader taught them. Or maybe the person who began the church, the founder of, an, of a religious organization. So every time and now and then they will quote so and so said this, so and so said this, because they don't want to open up for the Holy Spirit to, <clears throat> to teach them what the Bible or what the book of the Bible requires, what God wants you to hear. <clears throat> so most of the time, uh, you must ask the Holy Spirit to guide you uh, to understand the book of the Bible, because most of the people who founded these churches some of them added their own things just to get the big followers. 
But again, uh, we've realized that most people, <clears throat> those founders, the, the, the spurious things that they taught, those stuff, the false things that they taught, spread a lot. And in fact, that is what made them to, 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 to gain acceptance and to have a lot of followers. So be very careful as you study the Bible and do not interpret the Bible the way you think. <clears throat> in our next session, when discussing the understanding of the book of Revelation, we will go to, I mean, um, chapter 2. I will start it from chapter 2 and we will go on expanding on what these churches mean. So thank you very much for listening. May God bless you.